these laws are obviously homophobic, um, but they use the language of the poor little children need to be protected from, you know, um, what they call um, gay propaganda or things like that. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Prostasia Foundation's podcast vodcast series, Sex, Human Rights and CSA Prevention. Today we have the privilege of talking to Veronica Yates, who's the director of the Child Rights International Network. So we'll be talking to her about child rights, human rights, and how that all relates to child protection. Tell me a little bit about uh, your background. Uh, so you work for an organization called CRIN. Uh, tell us a little bit more about them. Yes, so uh, thank you for having me. So my organization is called the Child Rights International Network, and we are, we're sort of like a think tank of children's rights. That's what uh, we are calling ourselves in our current iteration. We've existed for quite some time and were initially set up to uh, collect information and share information about the United Nations Convention on Rights of the Child. But we've evolved over time and today we see ourselves as the, the only children's rights think tank. So what are children's rights and, and where do these come from? I think you, you mentioned already the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Is that the, the source? Yes. So t tell us a little bit about that for those who may not be familiar with it. Sure. So, well, children are humans and humans have rights. So children have human rights. But of course, because of their, um, they have specific needs or vulnerabilities um, that are different from, say, um, needs or vulnerabilities uh, that most adults have. Because of that, they are, we, we have the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which sets out specific uh, rights that children have that differ from adults. But of course, they also have all other human rights that adults have, including the right to health, to education, to be protected from violence, to due process, justice rights, the right to privacy, to free expression, etc. So the UN Convention on Rights of the Child has now uh, was adopted 30 years ago, in fact, this year, and has been um, ratified so by almost every country in the world, only the United States has not ratified it, in fact. And this means that all of these states have the responsibility. Yes, well, uh, we're not going to go into that, I, I suspect, today. But it means that all of these states that have signed up to the convention have an obligation to align their laws uh, with the UN Convention on Rights of the Child, so all of these specific rights that, um, that children have. So you mentioned that amongst those, obviously, is the right to privacy. It strikes me that often we tend to, um, we, we tend to downplay or ignore uh, that right. Are, are there some, do you think that it's true that there are some rights of children that our society tends to focus on and others that we tend to exclude? And, and uh, would there be any others uh, apart from privacy that you think that's true of? Yes, I think it's it's absolutely true. Um, most um, most civil society organizations or, or NGOs, and most adults, I suppose, uh, tend to focus or understand or agree with children's protection rights, but they are only some of the rights that are in the Convention on Rights of the Child. In fact, sometimes organizations say child protection and they think that's all children's rights are about. Um, and they're not, of course. They have the right to privacy. They have the right to free expression. They have civil and political rights the same way adults have, but they've, they've never really been realized or talked about or debated much, in particular civil and political rights. But there are other rights like due process, access to justice. Uh, these rights are also very much denied when it comes to to children or certainly not prioritized. Mm. And is there a, a, an agenda behind that? Is it, is it the case that uh, um, sometimes children's rights are used to further some other agenda or a particular framing of children rights, children's rights is a pretext for furthering some other agenda? Can you give any examples of, of that? Yes, I mean, on the scale, you have people who believe in human rights and believe that we all, you know, should have these rights realized, including children, but they might not feel comfortable with some aspects of children's rights. But of course, you also have on the other spectrum, those who actually misuse children's rights to justify uh, 
their own agenda. And we have, you know, some examples that are particularly horrendous, for example, um, what are called the um, anti, anti-gay anti laws that we've seen across, uh, you know, Russia and other Eastern European countries that have been passed to allegedly um, protect children from harmful information. And these laws are obviously homophobic, um, but they use the language of the poor little children need to be protected from, you know, um, what they call um, gay propaganda or, or, or things like that. You know, that that's the really insidious. You also have another ongoing um, wave of what we call um, f- uh, protection of the family, which is which is something that's ongoing currently in the United Nations, but internationally as well, very much sort of driven by populist agenda. But this is, again, using the language of protecting children or saying children have a right to a mother and a father, or that, you know, there have been some attempts in some states to 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 try and change the definition of the family to specify that a family equals man, woman, children. But beyond, you know, being anti-LGBT, for example, it's also it's also anti-women. It's you know, it, it's essentially very patriarchal. Uh, so, but you also have in some other cases, you know, perhaps less severe. One of, one of the things we tend to do is to also analyze case law around the world, and so we we've, we've looked at um, we've looked at you know over hundred cases in 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 many countries around the world. And we found that there are also quite a few instances, not the majority, but where, you know, for example, um, you know, in divorce cases uh, where it's a, a, you know, a fight for the custody of children and, you know, one side may argue it's in the best interest of the child to live with ex parent because that's what that parent wants. So they're not actually asking children what they want, but they are you know, using the language of children's rights to to justify, uh, to justify you know, what they want, but it's not actually about children; it's about them, the adults. So, how can that sort of rhetoric be countered? What's it, what's the approach that y- your organisation takes, for example, to to fight back against that tendency? Well, I guess the first thing would be that uh, we should let children speak for themselves, and you know how you do that. It's it's there are many ways. We believe children should have the right to vote and there shouldn't be a minimum age for voting, but that's not the case in, in anywhere in the world. There are a few states where children can vote, uh, seven, 16 and 17 year olds can vote. That's you know one example of many, but I think the first step would be to you know allow children to express themselves as well in all matters that concern them. And for this, you know, for, for their opinions to be taken into account, not just for you know, tokenistic purposes. But as organizations, human rights organizations or advocates, I think we shouldn't we shouldn't shy away from using the language of rights. And there is a bit of a tendency in especially the children's rights field to not want to be um, you know too controversial or or we we want consensus you know so we kind of shy away from the language and so we 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 keep we talk about protection we talk about those rights that everyone agrees with but we don't want to be confrontational and i think this is a problem as well i think there's also um, a fear of using the human rights language because some people you know see it as a negative um a, a negative thing i think we have we have that in the United States, in the UK as well, to some extent. Some, for some reason, human rights with the kind of tabloid press gets a bad rep. But instead of not using the human rights language, we should use it in an uncompromising way. We, we can still talk about human rights without being overly legalistic or, or jargon or sound patronizing or anything. It's just, you know, we should, we, and, and we should, you know, we should hold them to account. We should challenge them. We shouldn't just move away and say, let's not talk about rights because we don't want to upset anyone. There's a tendency in, in the UN, for example, you know, it's not just about populist movements or anti-human rights people. There, there's also this, for example, in the UN system where we have, you know, the Human Rights Council, and this is where a lot of resolutions are debated by states and adopted. For many human rights issues, they'll debate a resolution, it can go on for days or weeks, and then there's a vote. 
and you have, you know, whatever, however, however many votes, that's the result. And then you have amendments or, or whatever. But when it comes to children's rights, there's almost never a vote. So that means we, 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 we will continue debating and negotiating until we reach a consensus. But what does that inevitably mean is we end up with the lowest common denominator. But then is there any point in having a text that's really weak and doesn't really say anything or challenge wrongdoers or, or challenge, you know, obligations of states and what they're not doing? I, I, I think it, it's a bit pointless. So you mentioned earlier that um, uh, it's a challenge to move away from the framing of protection of children to children's rights. Um, how can we do that for um, child sexual abuse prevention? Because that's one of our focus areas at Prostasia Foundation. How can we frame child sexual abuse prevention in terms of rights? So under you know, the Convention on Rights of the Child, uh, and it's so international law, the, you know, the convention requires states to amend their laws to protect children from sexual abuse and, and other forms of abuse and neglect. That is already part of the convention and states have to report on what they're doing. In practice, of course, um, it's, it's a slightly different issue. I think what one of the problems that we have seen, or at least from our perspective, is that, well, there are two issues, I guess. One is that states tend to want to prefer or prioritize working on the really horrific cases, you know, the trafficking of children, uh, pornography involving children, the, you know, the child kidnappings and, and all of these stories that get a lot of press. But in actual fact, we know that the vast majority of sexual abuse happens either within the home or if not within the home, very, very close to the home, you know, close friends or, or, or relatives. But that doesn't get the same, the same amount of, of attention. It, that's a, a separate issue. The, the other issue is also that um, accountability and transparency, but accountability for, um, uh, you know, impunity for the perpetrators is really key. And that's also a form of prevention. And again, often in the case of children, we don't prioritize this. If there are cases, you, well, first of all, usually it's only decades later that um, survivors come forward if, if nobody knew about it. You know, that's another issue. But, but when we are aware of cases, there's a tendency to think that we just need to protect the child. And so, you know, re-interviewing the child or, or you know, taking them through a, a criminal justice system so that the perpetrator is held to account will only serve to re-traumatize the child and so we don't want to do that but but that's denying children due process and, and that's in a way punishing them for having an ineffective justice system that doesn't re-traumatize children because there are other ways of you know it's our justice system that should be adapted it's not the justice system that it's not justice that should be denied so but there's a tendency to, to just not see children as as you know, people who also have a right to due process and justice and compensation or whatever it is that, that you know, they might want. And there are ways of interviewing children and supporting children through this process that doesn't have to re-traumatize them. And that's what we should be focusing on as well, you know, in, 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 terms, of, in terms of sexual abuse of children. So let me return to something you just mentioned, uh, which is about accountability and transparency of the work that we do to protect children. One of the things that Prostasia Foundation has found is that there seems to be a different set of standards applicable um, in terms of uh, accountability and transparency uh, when it comes to child rights or child protection versus other areas um, due to the sensitivity of this area. Um, do you think that there is, uh, there should be separate standards or, or can we uh, aspire to the same standards of accountability and transparency in, in the work that we do to protect children as we do in other areas? I mean, of course, we should have higher levels of accountability and, and transparency, although it depends how we define transparency. Uh, but of course we should, but reality Again, this links to this idea of justice because that's never the priority. It's easy to, to 
hush things up, you know, and so that the child shouldn't be, um, should you know, the child's identity, for example, shouldn't be made uh, public, or you know, all of these various issues that that are sometimes used as an excuse not to proceed with accountability and holding perpetrators to account. Obviously, all organisations that work directly with children or you know, in relation to children should have much higher standards. But that doesn't mean that we don't that you know take their um, their opinions into account and treat them equally and fairly as well and and give them choices as to what can happen. But if you look at it on an institutional level, you know, now that um, silence has been broken on so many, on, on, you know, hundreds of thousands of cases, uh, many that happened, you know, five decades earlier, now we're starting to see how you know, that secrecy is what has allowed perpetrators to continue abusing children in institutions, you know. Now we've seen a lot in, in religious institutions, and particularly with the Catholic Church, but other uh, religious institutions too, and I'm sure others will start um, coming forward eventually. We're seeing it as well in, of course, boarding schools and orphanages. There still is very little attention because the truth is that most people don't really... Um, care that much about children in orphanage. They're often forgotten. Children with disabilities, they're, they're, they're twice as likely as other children to be sexually abused. Um, again, we never talk about this. And a lot of people working directly with the children are not even required to, to um, you know, to have safeguarding or training in place or, or any of those things. And those children are, um, you know, we know also from research that um, the more vulnerable the child, the more they are likely to become, um, you know, a target for the perpetrators as well. So it's sort of an endless, um, you know, circle. No justice, secrecy, no accountability. So they continue, it continues and continues. And now we see adults who come forward after, you know, um, having been, you know, sexually abused decades earlier. So how do taboos and stigmas around children and sexuality affect the protection of their rights? Because, of course, children, we often hear the... Uh, or we often, it often seems to be assumed that children are asexual beings until they reach the age of 18 or the age of consent, whatever that is, and, and then suddenly they have a full blossoming of their sexuality in an instant. Um, and it, it, it's often taboo to discuss or to... Um, uh, t to take account of the fact that actually there's a progression of their development of adult sexuality. Um, but it seems to be taboo to, to acknowledge or to discuss that. Does, is that a factor mm -hmm. that plays into the, um, the difficulty of protecting them um, uh, and, and yeah. recognising their rights? Absolutely. And I think it goes back to the, you know, the question, the, the, one of the earlier questions about what are some rights that are um, neglected or, or not really talked about. And sex and relationships is definitely one of them. And, you know, of course, there's the, you know, there's the issue that adults feel very uncomfortable. They don't want to talk about it. And that's OK, because in the, in the reality is that most children don't want to talk to their parents or often not even their teachers about sex. They would quite like to know about it, but probably not from their parents or, or um, you know, or their teachers. But there is, you know, there is recognition that's growing that teaching children at an earlier age about uh, sex, sexuality, relationships, consent, and what consent means does help prevent, uh, you know, prevent sexual abuse. Because if they are better informed, then they are better able to, to give consent or not, or to you know, not allow anyone to sexually abuse them. It's, when you think about it, it's so obvious, isn't it? It's about, and again, this goes back to this issue of harmful information. We don't want to talk about sex, so we just do this kind of really awkward biological sex education, but it doesn't talk about relationships or anything else. But, you know, there are some, there are some countries that are starting to do much more progressive kind of sex education, including diversity, including talking about, you know, different forms of families and relationships and more fluid gender identity as well. So it is starting to, to become recognized. And there are some international organizations like the Council of Europe 
they've done some really good resources for for teachers and for parents to you know how you know sort of they created these characters how to talk to children about you know where it's okay to touch and where it's not okay to touch um as well as you know sex education generally speaking so so that you know they are there is progress. There is also regression because, you know, we've seen in the UK recently that parents have been um, protesting outside schools that are offering sex education and relationship education where they talk about same sex relationships and parents have been demonstrating. But, um, you know, the teachers and the councils and, you know, politicians have have surprisingly, I guess, have, uh, you know, have stood strong. They've said, no, it's, it's their right, you know, and, and we, uh, we should be talking about all kinds of relationships for children. It's in their interest. Well, so progress. Uh, th that's good to hear because uh, certainly in the United States, that's a, a very live debate as well. Um, and it's, it's refreshing to hear uh, from you about, about the approach that uh, the Child Rights International Network is taking, but it seems to me that there are some some more conservative child protection organizations out there that uh, resist um, some of the um, the broader human rights um, framework for for this discussion. Um, what are some of the tensions that exist between these uh, older child protection organizations and those that situate their work in a, a human rights framework? So beyond, you mean, for example, Sex education and, and yeah, well, that's the kind of issue. Yeah. That, that, that's a very good. Yeah, that's a very good. Uh, ma maybe that's the best example. But are there any other areas where there's a tension? Yeah, I mean, of course there are. It, you know, you could just talk about LGBT rights. You know, we take them for granted in the UK and the US, but but there are many countries where it's still illegal to have uh, same sex relationships. So that's certainly uh, one issue. And there is also, for example, privacy. This is something we've done quite a bit of work on with other organizations and freedom of expression organizations. Um, recently, in particular, in, rela in relation to children's rights in the digital space. Again, this is where the protection organizations are, you know, maybe not on purpose, some on purpose, some not, are almost condoning censorship or, you know, blanket um, filters to s that stop children accessing useful information about sex or any other issue, even drugs or, or violence or abuse, you know, whatever it is they're looking for. Filters tend to block everything out. So it leaves the children already vulnerable, even more vulnerable than they were before they were looking for this information. And, and privacy, most people just do not believe children have the right to privacy the way they think adults do. I mean, already many adults don't have a problem with their phones, you know, essentially being a recording device and all of their information being, uh, you know, you know, um, owned by by companies like Facebook and Google. But um, but when it comes to children, they th think it's absolutely fine to um, follow children everywhere, have cameras in their rooms and, you know, monitor what you're doing online, essentially we're normalizing uh, surveillance uh, of children and uh, and that's uh, become, uh, that's that's quite surprising. So there's a little bit of tension between child protection organizations and the human rights ones. We tend, we're trying to find ways, you know, areas of, of, of agreement because ultimately it doesn't have to be one or the other, you know, it doesn't. There will always be, you know, we can, you know, take religion, for example, take bodily integrity. These are other issues that we're working on where, you know, many adults do not think that children have the right to choose their own religion, which they do, or choose no religion. But this is this is another big no-go area. Um, so there's still a lot of work to be done on that one. And many of the big civil society organizations are actually religious themselves. So therefore, uh, you know, they're never going to be talking about freedom of religion or freedom from religion. So it seems to me that part of the uh, problem with some organizations is that the breadth of the stakeholders who participate is, is not as inclusive as it could be. Um, how has the Child Rights International Network and its members sought to increase the diversity of the stakeholders who participate and whose views are represented in its work? So I, I tend to have slightly, um, you know, 
radical views, I guess, of, of the world of NGOs or civil society. I don't like it very much, essentially. I think there are too many organizations, too many organizations that are not quite sure why they exist, but they keep existing. But be, beyond that, I think, you know, it. we spent we spent many years working almost exclusively with and among organizations that focus on child protection, some on children's rights, but mostly it tends to be welfare protection and development and, and just found that it was not challenging. It wasn't, it was very separate from human rights organizations, sort of. So, but we felt all we were doing is talking amongst ourselves and nothing was really changing. So we thought that if we wanted to explore other rights that were not looked at, privacy, freedom of expression, justice, we had to go outside of our usual um, usual suspects. So one of the first things we did was to, to, to approach human rights organizations, because often human rights organizations don't work on children's rights either. It's like there's this kind of great divide. Um, children's rights are not seen as proper human rights in a way. And so we, we've started partnering and working directly with, you know, other small organizations that might focus on a particular group. So we've done quite a bit of work with LGBT groups or some women's rights groups or uh, groups that are working on uh, disability rights and also with groups that focus on specific issues, freedom of expression, privacy, justice, etc. And so we found that in that way, we it's been much more effective and much more useful because we come to the table with our our unique expertise or, or understanding of an issue and experience and which differs from the others. And so we've we've actually been able to, to achieve much more by working with people who work differently because we're bringing diversity of issues. And, and in today, you know, this is, this is what we should all be doing. We should be all be working with people who are working on different issues from different perspectives in different ways, because otherwise we're just talking to the, you know, we're just speaking to the converted. So we need to build new allegiances and new coalitions, but it's not just civil society organizations. It needs to be solidarity movements, individual activists, academia, pro bono lawyers, etc. It needs to be much broader. Uh, we also work with artists. Uh, we've been doing quite a lot of work recently with artists and working in the art sector to, to, you know, so that the language of rights isn't just, you know, a legalistic text within the United Nations, but that it's also, you know, it's about it's about philosophy, it's about debate, it's about conversations, about sharing of ideas. And so we're trying to talk to different kinds of people who would, you know, who might not really know that all of this human rights stuff or exists, but but share the same values. Well, that's that's very inspiring and uh, certainly something that uh, I hope that Prostasia Foundation can be a part of. Um, we've just about run out of time, but the way that I usually close off an interview is just to ask if uh, there's any resources that you recommend uh, people could consult if they're interested in what you've had to say and would like to find out more. Well, please do visit our website um, if that's uh, relevant. It's it's evolving and we, we also love to get contributions Um so our website is www.crin.org and we have a library which links to work of other organizations as well. So I think that's the main one for now, if I may sell my own. Of course, <laughs> absolutely. Well, thank you very much. This has been a great conversation and, uh, and as I say, very inspiring. So, so thank you very much for taking your time to talk with us today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for watching this episode of Sex, Human Rights and CSA Prevention. To make sure you don't miss future episodes, please subscribe. If you are watching on YouTube, you can do that by clicking one of these icons here and the other icon will help you to donate to support our work. Thanks again for watching, we'll see you next time. Bye for now.